Okay, then we'll start. First, welcome. Welcome very much to uh, the Ingus presentation. It feels quite strange actually now that I know the camera's on me and there's still just the, the two of you here. So I'm going to make it less formal, but what we wanted to... Can you hear me? Okay. There's a lot of noise. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Let's do that. So the purpose of the workshop is to discuss the development of career services in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia applies to the higher education sector. And what I'm going to look to try and do is to give some examples of best practice from the West, in particular to focus on the UK market, uh, which is uh, quite an evolved market in terms of careers education within the higher education system. So to kick off the workshop, I just want to I'll give you a little bit of an overview around INGIS as an organisation so you know who it is that's here today. So it's probably one of the largest companies you've never heard of. So as a business it started in 1989 in Australia and then was a provider of rehabilitation services to people who were injured for whatever reason and needed to return to work. So from then it's grown substantially over that time to become what I'd probably best describe as an international employability services provider. And we were currently in the UK, France, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland and South Korea, as well as Australia. And most recently we opened our business in Saudi Arabia in 2011. So we've been here now for over two years. In terms of the focus of the conference is very much around special education needs and in terms of Indus's core business, working with people with disability that provides barriers to work is still very much part of, of what we do, so we're, we're used to working in that area. In Saudi Arabia since 2011 we work predominantly with the government's HRDF uh, division deliver the Job Placement Centre programme, the TACAT initiative. So over that time we've helped over 12,000 Saudis return to work, so quite a significant achievement. Now, as part of our business expansion programme... Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hello, hello, how are you? So, just a little bit of moving around. Gentlemen, thank you for coming along. Good to see you. Just to uh, recap quickly, the workshop today is about the development of career services education within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay? And what I'm going to try to do is talk about that in the context of international best practice. No, sorry, it's going to be in English. Is that... No translation, no. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Uh, right, I understand. If you can try, and I'll try to, yeah, to be clear. And what we can do, if we get your details, we can send a copy of the presentation in Arabic for you after the event, if that helps. Okay? If you have any particular questions, my colleague Talal is here and he'll be able to respond. Okay. Uh, can you close the door? Thanks. So, yeah, so we're, we're talking about careers education within the kingdom. Yeah. Well, we'll translate it and we'll send it to you in Arabic. Yes? Okay. Our pleasure. Yeah, please do. Please do. So, looking at it from an international best practice perspective, particularly looking at the UK market which has a very evolved 
careers education sector within the higher education field. And I was just giving a bit of a background to INGIUS. So in addition to the work we do with the government, we have a number of other service lines which are designed to support career services within higher education. So currently within the Kingdom, our clients include EFAT, Al Faisal, Imam and Tabuk TVTC, so three universities and Tabuk TVTC. And I'm very pleased to say that we opened our first full at the University of Isle yesterday, which is a significant Thank you, Shiruk, thank you very much, which is a very significant achievement for Indus and something that we are very proud of. Okay? So, what I probably just want to do is to talk about the careers education of graduates within a broader context of youth unemployment. Yes? And globally, youth unemployment is a major challenge to the majority of the developed world and as a result it's a key agenda on you know most governments table and I think outside of Saudi Arabia certainly in the West this has developed as a result of global recession going back you know over five years now and the result of the uncertain economic situation in the West and it's had a, a real impact on how the higher education system has had to react to increase the employability of its undergraduates and graduate population and the fact of the matter is it's from an Ivy League university or its equivalent you're no longer guaranteed a job however is this a bit have we got your email? We don't understand in uh, more English. I understand. Uh, this is our uh, email. And it, uh, if you can send it uh, in Arabic. Email, and very thanks for you. Oh, thank you. And do, are you from a, a university or a...? Uh, you are secondary school. Secondary school. Secondary okay. School. Thank Brilliant. You. No, thank, thank you ever so much. Thank you, thank you for you. trying. Yeah, cheers. Thank thanks. Sorry, sorry. Don't move chairs again. I think that, that must be my shining personality. Anyway. So my point is, is that if in any higher education system now, the econo eco economy of the world means that there are no guaranteed jobs for graduates, or not to the same level that there was 15 to 20 years ago, yes? However, whilst there may not be guaranteed jobs, there's often guaranteed debt because the cost of higher education for students, certainly in the West, is increasing year on year. So if you look at the UK market, for example, and look at the impact that this has had on the higher education system and how it's reacted, in the UK, the school leaver age will be increased from 16 to 18 by 2015. So you can no longer leave school at 16 and that's very much with the view to making sure that people are either engaged with education or employment. If you look at how the college system in the UK is funded, a percentage of their funding from the government is linked directly to job outcomes. So if they don't get students into work, their funding is affected. And a, a similar scenario will take place within Saudi Arabia with the Colleges of Excellence, which are currently being set up by providers of the, the, the private sector. And if you look at the university sector in the UK, the cost of tuition has risen considerably over the last five years. So now, if you want to go to university in the UK, it will cost your parents £9,000 per year to put you through. So it's no longer grant funded. And as a result, what you see is that uh, places at university are down by 6.3%. Because as a parent, if I'm going to invest in your higher education, I want to make sure that you're going to have a job when you come out. I want to make sure that you're not going to come out saddled with debt and back living in my house, me paying for you again. Yes? So there's been a real need 
for universities to be more attractive to students. And a way in which they've done that, as well as offering academic excellence, is to have a very strong employability offer. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, Saudi Arabia is very similar, albeit the drivers behind it are very different. So clearly, Saudi as an economy is a burgeoning one. It's growing rapidly. And it isn't affected to the same degree, obviously, as the West in terms of the recession. However, Saudi has, next to Greece and Spain, the third highest level of youth unemployment in the world, with 41% youth unemployment for those aged between 15 to 24. Okay. You couldn't stay away, you're back. Um, so Saudi has a very high level of youth unemployment and at the same time it's got a lot of economic and structural initiatives that it needs to put in place to develop a, a more mixed economy around knowledge and service based industries. It has to address, Sharuk, obviously the barriers for females entering work. And this ingrained preference for people who would prefer public sector work to private sector work when the real growth is no doubt going to be within the private sector. And currently, there's a real dearth of careers education in place within the kingdom to address those challenges. So, what's the impact of that? Well, there's a real danger of a displaced youth, the lost generation of people with qualifications who aren't gainfully employed and adding value to the economy. And it's, in my opinion, it's never been more important for the world of academia and work to come together to address this situation and we know that from a Ministry of Labour and a Ministry of Higher Education perspective there is a real emphasis now on institutes of higher education to provide improved career services and employability support. So on that basis what have been the key, the, the key issues in the West that Saudi would do well to learn from as it looks to develop in this area. And in my opinion, there are probably four. Firstly, and absolutely, it's about making careers employer-centric. So making sure that employers within the private sector are at the very heart of how career services are developed and how they're delivered. And I'm not just talking about the placement of people into co-op and interns, but I'm talking about the support to find work throughout the whole of their academic time, obviously their support to find permanent employment, but making sure that employers are involved in the development of programmes, not only for the technical skills required in industry, but also for those all-important softer skills that make students more productive from day one in the workplace. And when we speak to a lot of employers, they say to us that you know a lot of graduates, they come into work and they're very intelligent, they're academically bright, but often they lack a lot of softer skills that would make them good team players, uh, good leaders within the workplace, and a lot of basic skills that are fundamental to success in your career. So more focus on those softer skills, in effect. I think there's also a real challenge to embed employment and careers into the curriculum. So it isn't just something that people think of six months before they leave, but it's embedded well before then. And the academic staff also understand the importance of careers education and build that into their curriculum. Thirdly, I think it's about the reach and engagement of a career service in as much as often a criticism of a careers function within an institute is that not enough people come to it, not enough people uh, come to it to use the service and as a result careers departments can struggle to demonstrate the return on investment to the teams of rectors and deans and the powers that be who control the budget. So there's a, a real need to be able to demonstrate that moving forward. So how has the West and in particular the UK address those challenges and to, to be quite frank 
career services within the United Kingdom has developed considerably over the last 10 years, hugely as a result of the changes we've talked about. And I'll just give you one example. On average now, the size of a careers function in a mature UK university is around about 20 to 25 full-time people. Yeah? And the careers service industry is a professional industry in its own right. Governed by an organisation called AGCAS, which is the Association of Graduate Careers and Advisory Services. It is quality assured through the Matrix Accreditation, uh, which is a quality assurance model built around the delivery of advice and guidance. And what you have in careers functions within the UK are effectively integrated specialist teams. So if you look at the diagram there, you have your careers advisors who are very much around taking students on their one-to-one -one journey of understanding their potential and career options. And then you have your facilitators and trainers who may deliver a whole raft of skills learning to students, either on a one-to-one -one or face or in a group basis. And also a key thing around the training function within a careers team is to train the trainer. And a lot of trainers within the UK spend time with academic teams, helping them to build in employability modules within their academic curriculum. So that train the trainer concept means that people can get to more students, yes? Um, within the UK, another thing that has become more prevalent in recent years is that careers, education and professional development has become almost compulsory. So if you're going through your degree, you have to take certain modules of professional development in order to get units to enable you to qualify. So there's been a very serious shift in putting jobs and careers at the heart of what a university does. Yes? And an example of that is the Ashridge Business School in the UK, which is a world-renowned institution uh, where they deliver the MBA, um, both face-to-face -face and online. And fundamentally, if you're on the Ashbridge MBA, if you do not take your professional development course, you will not get that master's degree. Okay? And I think another way in which the industry has reacted to support students and the best practice is that it's now available, services are now available in different formats to suit different learning styles, which has led to an increase in the use of technology to support the careers process, okay? Morning. Hello. How are you? I'm just talking about, just very quickly, I'm talking about the development of careers services within the higher education system of Saudi Arabia, the importance of that moving forward to help address youth unemployment, and I'm just talking about best practice that you can take from the UK market which is a very evolved function in terms of careers to higher education and how you can build some of that into the Saudi system. Does that make sense? So you'll have to bear with me. Yeah, so technology is, uh, has been a, a major um, change within the delivery of career services, the use of technology, which I'll come on to in a second. So there's... In terms of the, 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 the student journey to work, it's still pretty much the same, it, it, and it's still got this one-to-one -one focus, yeah? And I think if history tells us anything, is that students really benefit from that one-to-one -one, uh, support that they can get from a careers advisor. And in particular, for students with special education needs, that's absolutely paramount if you know, you're going to be able to, to deal effectively uh, with certain health conditions and enable people to progress to work, okay? I think if anything that journey has extended in terms of careers so that it now includes a very strong alumni offer and almost an offer of a career service for life. So in the UK the majority of universities and colleges of higher education 
will keep their career service open to alumni for any number of years afterwards if alumni want to keep coming back in for support. Again, previously I mentioned the importance of employer engagement and within any kind of careers education team now within a university in the UK, there are employer engagement professionals whose role it is purely to go out, work with employers, get their advocacy to graduate programmes and help move that transition from academia to work. And a real thing that they do, a real focus of theirs, is to focus on educating the employer so that they understand how to manage a graduate workforce, so that they understand how to induct a new job seeker and give them the skills to be productive from day one. So I think it's very easy to expect the graduate or to put all of the onus on the graduate to, to do the learning, but I think it's also important to ensure that the employer is flexible and has a, a system built for new people coming in. So that's what employer engagement does, it works both ways. And I think whilst a lot of the process is the same, it's just delivered in a number of formats. So I've called it people, bricks and clicks. People are still the most important face-to-face, -face, absolutely. Bricks in terms of place, the ability to go to a career centre that's on site, that's highly visible, that a career centre that reeks of opportunity, reeks of jobs, yes? So you motivate people to engage. And then I think on the click side, that's very much around the use of technology. Is that, do you want to say, yes? Do you want to ask a question, sorry, Shri? Yes. And use of technology, absolutely, yes. So if I just um, move on to, to that now and talk about it in more detail, um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk specifically about the INGIS Online Careers Centre. And then I'm going to couch that or position that so that you understand the benefit that a system like that can bring to a careers department whether it be to enable a careers team to coordinate and control its own activities or as an e-learning tool which helps students and alumni to help themselves, if that makes sense. So I just need to get one of those guys to turn the sound up a little bit so I can play this video, if that's okay. So, uh, Shakir, could you just ask... Stop. Thank you for Thank you. 
and alone. I need to turn, oh, actually it's fine, I'll just go like this, yeah it's fine. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a good idea as to the scope of the functionality within the career centre, the online career centre. So uh, it's kind of have a, good morning, hi. It, it has, I suppose, a twofold functionality. First is as an e-learning resource for students themselves or alumni and it enables them to go onto a system which they could access very easily through the university's learning management system so they would use the same logon and password to access uh, the career centre. So very user friendly and it can be plugged into your LMS very easily so integrates with it. And they can go on to the system and they can do anything from learning about particular types of occupation uh, to developing their own CVs to taking practice interviews online. They can have a look at a whole raft of e-learning courses around soft skills ranging from how to organise a meeting to the basics of project management or the fundamentals of business finance. So a whole raft of relevant professional e-learning. And they can also have access to a whole range of psychometric tests and assessments which clearly they will need to get used to as part of their job application process for graduate opportunities. So it's, a, it's very much a self-help tool that can be made available to all students on campus and all alumni from the Institute. Now, one thing that people say to us is that that looks fantastic, yeah, looks really good. It's available in English and Arabic, so you can have a, you know, a preferred choice there. And it's, it's loaded with employer video footage. So you have Saudi employers talking about what they look for in a job application process, what they look for in the first three months at work and its employers being honest. So it's giving potential applicants or students insight into how an employer's mind works. But people say to us, well that's great Mike, looks fantastic, but how do you get people to come in and use it? Because that's the, the measure of success is how many people use it, yes? And that's the second function, I suppose, is how it's used to support a careers team such as yourself and in effect it can be used as a, an information management system okay so as it is plugged into the learning management system you can have direct access to students through the career centre and you can push and pull messages to them or you can push messages out to bring them back in rather so uh, uh, let me explain it at a very simple level. If you were a careers team and you had a team of X amount of advisors, and it may be that those advisors are aligned with a certain school, and maybe one that is the careers advisor for the business school, one for the engineering school, one for the humanities school, the system could be set up so that each advisor was able to caseload manage all students coming to them for advice from those schools, okay? and they could caseload manage them so they could have a one-to-one -one session with them. They could agree an action plan over the next few months to improve employability, research the jobs market, whatever the action plan may be. They can then confirm that action plan on the system and they can communicate confirmation out to the student, which gives them reminders of deadlines for when activities should be completed. So once the one-to-one -one has taken place, the advisor can still reach out to the student at any time. And it can communicate, or he or she can communicate employer-related events to make sure that they know who's going to be turning up, whether that be workshops, careers events, or what have you. So it's a, a real management tool for a careers team that makes their job easier. And of course, because you can track usage and you can track action plan activity, you can demonstrate to people who is using the system, who is engaging with the careers function, and you can develop your return on investment to the powers that be and the budget owners. So an example of that is Leeds University in the UK 
where before we introduced the online careers centre, on average they had up to say 500 people a year coming into their physical career centre to meet advisors. When we introduced the online career centre, over the first 12 months, the number had increased from 500 to over 10,000. Now that isn't 10,000 coming into the career centre, that increased to 2,000. But the number of people who were accessing support from the careers function was over 10,000. And that was because people in many ways preferred to access in their own time online. So it's a considerable increase and you can imagine from a kind of budgetary perspective the return on investment was clearly justified. Okay? So that's a bit about the online career centre and as uh, I said, well as the, the lady said in the video, that can be customisable to any university. So currently FAT University um, use it, uh, Al Faisal use it, um, Heil, obviously, which I'll come on to in a second, to book TVTC, Alariba Training College, and they all use it in different ways. But you can import your own information in there, yeah? So you can use it as your own careers resource. Um, it's fully branded to look like it's coming from you, not like Inges. So there are many ways in which it can be adapted um, to meet your individual needs. Okay. I just want to now end the presentation, I suppose, with a very brief summary of the University of Heil. So I've talked about the context around youth unemployment globally and as it applies to Saudi. And in actual fact, Heil is probably the city that is most affected by youth unemployment. There's a significant percentage of, of youth unemployment there and a real challenge given the geography of the city to make a difference and get people into work. So we've also talked about best practice and bringing it from the UK, adapting it culturally for Saudi but keeping the principles of best practice in place and the University of Heil for us is the first example of us doing that and they have invested in a partnership with Ingus to deliver an on-site career centre for their students. Now in the first year we will focus on the graduate population, so there will be around about 2,000 and they will be from the male college. Subject to that first year, the challenge then is to take a much bigger, broader service to the entire college and obviously that will include the female population. So what we're really trying to do is bring this learning, adapt it to Saudi Arabia, and Heil is the first case in point where they have outsourced their careers function to Ingus. And we're extremely proud of having managed to get that opportunity. And we're, as well as being proud, we see it as being strategically important because we genuinely believe, and we know that it's part of the Ministry of Labour's strategy to have institutes of higher education improve career service delivery. We genuinely believe that the model that we have in place in Heil can be picked up and put in place in any number of institutes of higher education in the kingdom moving forward. Adapted, absolutely, because student populations differ, but Nevertheless, that best practice could be put in place elsewhere. And we very much look forward to that opportunity. So, thank you very much for giving me your time, particularly you, you're a delight. And um, I hope you found the presentation informative. And I'm happy just to have a, a general discussion now about anything I've, I've discussed. But I suggest I maybe just come over there for that. Okay, thank you very much.